All right. So also, I have another confession to make. Uh, another confession? I never made any confessions yet. This is my first one. Okay. So it, during, I was away, as you know, for a few weeks, and I always work ahead on the devotional stuff that we're working through, uh, just so I can always stay a little bit ahead. Anyway, I work so far ahead that I'm actually a week ahead of where we're actually supposed to be. So I preached last week's sermon, and that was supposed to be this week's sermon. So my wife told me to re-preach it and see if anyone would notice, um, but... <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. Um, but uh, just so you know, if you have kids, oh, you won't have kids in Sunday school because there's no Sunday school here. But anyway, I'll let them know about that. So just so you know, we will catch up eventually, and I'll, put it, I'll make things right. Um, but we are a week ahead. So if you're wondering and you're working through your devotional and you know that, that's what's going on. So that was my fault. But anyway, we're here now, and we're, we're on it. So uh, the title of our, our sermon this morning is to No Longer Servants of Fear. No longer servants of fear. When I was in grade uh, seven, my family had decided to move from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, to Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, my grandparents on both sides lived in Victoria. My cousins lived in Victoria. My parents had met and got married in Victoria. And so there were many summers that we lived in Saskatoon that we loaded up the car and we set off on vacation to what I like to call the promised land, Victoria, where the air was dewy sweet, where there was no mosquitoes and the flowers and greenery kind of bursted forth of this glorious song saying, God has favored us and this land. Um, to me, even at that young age, it was really kind of odd and weird. I saw Saskatchewan as sort of like a, a, if you're from Saskatchewan, I apologize if you love it, uh, but as a sort of kind of like a wilderness kind of idea. And, and to me, the time had come and the wandering was over and it was time to enter the land of promise. And at the end of my grade seven year, we sold our home, we packed up, uh, the only home that I really ever remembered. And you would think, you know, I'd be sad in grade seven, leaving my friends, all that kind of thing. Uh, but I was actually really more excited to go and finally live in Victoria. Well, we made it to Victoria, and uh, one of the things about Victoria that was different than Saskatoon was that high school started in grade eight instead of grade nine. And uh, this meant that I was heading right into high school not knowing a soul, just moving into this city that was bigger than Saskatoon. And I, and I remember hearing about the high school that I was going to be going to. And I had heard that it was a tough high school. And so I was a bit scared. You know, I was young. I was 13 years old. And as the day grew closer, um, you know, uh, to going to this new high school, I started to have visions of bad things happening to me and wondering how I was, you know, in your little grade eight boy mind, you're wondering how you're going to defend yourself and all this kind of thing. And I was, I was worried. So when the day finally arrived, I, I went to school with much fear and trepidation, but I discovered as I went along that it, it really wasn't that bad. Now, grade eight came and went for the most part without incident, except for one moment. This one moment, I don't think that I will ever forget it. I remember it distinctly because of what happened and what I felt. I was sitting in social studies class, grade eight, 13 years old, and we were talking about the Christians during the medieval time. And this big guy in the desk in front of me, he was, and he was big, he wasn't small, he was big. He wasn't just big because I saw him as big. He was actually big. He was the biggest and strongest grade eight in the class. And he was sitting right in front of me, and he turned around, and he said to me, I hate Christians. And I hate Christians then, and I hate them now. He said, are you a Christian? Now, I didn't see that coming in the middle of socials class. Uh, and more often than not, I like to tell of times that I shared my faith. But in this moment, as this little grade eight kid, fear gripped me, and I said, no. I said, I'm not a Christian. And he said, yes, you are. <laughs> you know. I, know. I said, no, no, I'm not. I'm not, but I was. And I look back on that moment, and it often fills me with regret. The time that I had opportunity to share boldly, I was a coward. Even as I was saying it, I could feel this sense of kind of shame washing over me. And I vowed after that that I would never do that again, and, and, I, and I haven't. But in that moment, 
In my grade eight class, I served fear. And I made a choice. And it's a choice, really, that I still regret to this day. Have you ever done that? Maybe not denied that you were a follower of Jesus, but have, have you ever served fear? Have you ever allowed the fear of man, the fear of people to direct you? Maybe it came in a way of the fact that you didn't want to be known as the office religious guy or girl. Or maybe you saw another Christian in your workplace do some crazy things, and so you thought, if, if this gets out, maybe they'll stick me in that camp, and, and I'll never be able to move up the ladder here. And as a result, maybe you missed out on some opportunities to love somebody for Jesus. Or maybe it's just the, the fear of being rejected by a group or a person. You know, it could be in school, or it could be in work, or it could be at home. Have you ever served fear? Have you ever let fear like that make choices for you? And maybe for you, it was more than just keeping a low profile. Maybe it was the fear of being alone. Maybe the fear of, of whatever it was uh, came out in action, in the action of you actually doing something that you regret. Maybe to this day, you carry around some baggage from that time. That time you submitted to fear. I mean, the truth is, is that probably if we were all brave enough and honest enough, we would say, yes, yeah, yeah, you know, I've done that. I've done it. Or maybe I'm doing it even now. Well, in our text today, we, we find not just one person doing that, but we find a whole army. And so just so you know, it, it's not just you. It's not just me. It was an army that was paralyzed by fear. And yet in one moment, they were released from that. In a single moment, they ceased to serve fear, and everything changed for them. What was that? And wouldn't that be great if it could change for us too? I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's probably one of the most famous biblical stories for both Christians and non-Christians. It's such a great story. It's the story of David and Goliath. Now, for the most part, because it will take a long time, I'm going to tell a lot of the story, and I'll interject with a few verses along the way as we go. But you can read along in your Bible if you want and make sure I'm telling it accurately if you have brought your Bible. Um, so here it goes. The Philistines, they were Israel's enemy. It's beginning to encroach on Israel's land. And they show up to attack Israel. The scripture says that they showed up in the area that belonged to the tribe of Judah. They show up and they're perched on, on, top, of this, on top of this hill and, and there is this, this valley. And so Israel shows up to defend its territory on, on, on a hill on the other side of the valley. So the Philistine army on one side, Israel on the other on the hill. And these two armies are really at a stalemate in a way. Because if one attacks first, they will have to descend into the valley, and the other side will have the advantage. And so they'll just rain down fury on the, on the country or the, the army that is down um, in the valley. And so each of them sit on either side of this valley, staring at each other in a stalemate. Until one day a man says, I'll fight. I'll end this. Now, this was not uncommon uh, in situations like this. A person, a champion from one side would challenge the other side to, to uh, send a champion to fight. And whoever won would be the winner of the battle. And so a man by the name of Goliath steps out from the Philistine camp and says, I, I will fight. The word champion, as they call Goliath in Scripture, directly translated, means a go-between. As in, I will step out as a go-between for the Philistine, Philistine army. I will represent the whole army. And what happens to me happens to you. And this man who, who steps out is described as standing, you know, close to nine feet, nine inches tall. This is a pretty big guy, much bigger than the guy that I met in grade eight. Tip of his spear was weighing in at 15 pounds. His armor is 125 pounds. That's more than some of you weigh in total. This guy was a, was a big guy. 
and he was strong, and he was scary. And for 40 days, he calls out Israel to send a go-between, a representative on their behalf, their own champion to fight him. He says in verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Whoever wins the battle is this challenge, the other will serve them. The stakes in this moment are high. But the Israelite army just sits on the mountain frozen in fear day after day. Goliath calls out for 40 days, twice a day. He challenges them. You remember the other time in history where the Israelites froze in, froze in fear because of giants? It's found in the book of Numbers. The first time they were going into the promised land. And they get to the gates of the promised land, and, and instead of just going in, they send some spies. And these spies search out the land for 40 days, too. And when these spies came back after their 40-day look around, all but two of them, Joshua and Caleb, all but those two, said, look, we cannot do it. Fear gripped them, and they made a choice. There is no way we can take that land, they said. There are giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers. For 40 days, they looked at those giants, and they let fear bring direction to them. As a result of that moment, Israel would wander for 40 years in the wilderness. As a result of them serving fear, they wandered for 40 years while that generation died off. And here we are in a way, back again. And for 40 days, the giant is back challenging Israel, really for this land, the promised land, the land that God had, had given them. And just like back in Numbers, they quake in fear. Humanity, and over the generations, it hasn't changed that much. And so this army is, is frozen in fear until this young shepherd boy shows up. He's probably around 15 years old. And he shows up to bring his brothers some food on the battlefield. And we see this in verses 22 and 23 of 1 Samuel 17. It says, And David left the things in, uh, in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and, and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Now, when Goliath came out and challenged them and talked like this, it freaked everyone out, but not David. Now, as I, as I read it, it sounds like to David that, that this is not really a big deal. He sounds a bit like Joshua after they went and spied out the land, after he came back. You know, and Joshua said, you know, he, he would say, you know, if God's going to fight for us, then, then we should be able to take this land. It shouldn't be an issue. And so David asks in this moment, he's like, so, you know, what's the person going to get if, we t if I, the person who takes him down, what, what will he get? And so verse 26, it says, and David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I mean, who is this joker that would say such things? Does he know who he's calling out? So the men heard what, what David said, and they, they went and they told Saul about this. And so Saul sends for David, and, and David says to Saul in verse 32, he says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Look, I know you're all scared, says this 15-year-old boy, but you don't have to be anymore. I'll go out and take care of it for you. I think, David, you're 15. So David tries on Saul's armor, and it doesn't really fit him. So he refuses it. And he just heads out in what he was wearing to meet Goliath with his shepherd's staff and his trusty sling. Now remember, the sling was a, it was a real weapon. It was not considered just a toy, you know, like those little ones you used to play with as a kid. No, they had actually divisions in the army of slingers. They had archers and they had slingers. 
And these slingers were actually quite deadly. And when David picks up the stones, uh, also know that the stones in that area, in that valley, they're different than most stones. They're much more dense in that valley. And David slinging that sling with those stones in that valley, I have read that it was the equivalent of a 44 caliber gun. And so it's no joke what he's packing here, right? It's a serious weapon. But Goliath, he doesn't see that. He just sees a young boy with a shepherd's staff, and he mocks David as though Israel's go-between, Israel's champion is some sort of joke. Goliath says in verse 43, and the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. David loads the sling Let's it go, and the 44 caliber rock lands a square between the eyes of Goliath. And Goliath collapses, and David goes over and he cuts off his head and he holds it high for everyone to see. Goliath is dead. And the Philistines saw that their champion, that their go between was dead. They take off running. And lo and behold, who chases them? Yeah, you got it. It's Israel. Why? I mean, if you look at the facts for just a minute, I mean, Israel's army was held captive by the fear of a man, or in this case, many men even. And this is an advanced Philistine army. And only one of the soldiers, one of the enemy soldiers dies. One man dies on the other army, and then poof, no more fear. No more quaking in their sandals. No more hiding. No, they're, they're pursuing. They're attacking. They're boldly running into that valley that they were afraid to go into in the first place. Boldly running into the valley to ascend the hill where the Philistines are. Why? It's one guy. What changed? What changed for Israel in that moment? Their perspective changed. You see, before David saw an advanced army, before David, they saw, as they looked, Israel's army, they saw an advanced army. They saw numbers. They saw strength. They saw a giant. All good reasons to be afraid. Then they looked on themselves and saw a lack, you know, like we talked about last week. They saw that, that they were not enough in a big way. But when David kills Goliath, what do they see now? They see God on their side. That's what changed. And when they saw God was fighting for them, all of a sudden their lack didn't matter. Their numbers didn't matter. The, the obstacles that they faced didn't matter. Being exposed in a valley didn't matter because they had victory. And that perspective changed everything. What the army needed as they faced down Goliath and the Philistine army, as they froze in fear, was not a pep talk by Saul. You can do it, guys. Come on. What they needed in that moment as Goliath was shouting and hurling these things, what they needed was a deliverer. You see, this story is not a story about how we really are supposed to be like David. There are things that we see that are David and that are good that we can apply to our life, absolutely. But I think the big crux of this story is not about how we should be like David. And I preached on this story a few years ago, and still people came up to me and said, yeah, I need to be like David. And I thought, no, 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 you're, you're missing the point of this story. And so let's just make sure that we're all on the same page for today. Uh, re repeat after me. Today, I am not David. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now good. We're all on the same page. And just so you know, your spouse or your boss is not Goliath. Okay? <laughs> you see, our place in this story is the soldier's. Our place in the story is that we need a deliverer. We need a champion. We need a go-between for us. Paul cries out in Romans, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will, what? Who will deliver me? I need a deliverer. Who's going to deliver me? 
And so God sends Jesus, and in many ways is our champion. He fights for us. And sure, the devil may have laughed when they thought they killed Jesus, just like Goliath may have, have laughed when, when, they saw this, when he saw this little 15-year-old shepherd boy that Israel had sent out. But Goliath did not laugh for long. And Jesus did not stay dead. Now, the cross was not a defeat. The cross was a victory. And just as the army of Israel partook of David's victory on the battlefield, we too, as followers of Jesus, take part in the victory of the cross and the resurrection. And folks, for us, it's, it's just, like it did, just like it did for Israel's army. And that changes everything. When they saw God moving and, and defeating their enemy on their behalf, they took off running. And they pursued the Philistines because their go-between slew that which held them in captive to fear. And so as we, we sit here on this Sunday morning, I would ask you, where, where are you at? Maybe more importantly, who, who are you serving? Is there anything in your life that, that you're responding to out of fear instead of the victory of Jesus and his resurrection? For you here today, listen to me. Jesus has won the battle. And you don't need me to stand up here and give you a pep talk and tell you, you guys can do it. You need to see that Jesus has defeated, has slain our Goliath. That the victory has already been won. And so you do not need to fear any longer. For you, what would it look like if you lived that way, saw that way, thought that way? Who would you impact through your life? That instead of living out of the fear of man or, or lived out of a fear at all and instead lived out of the victory of Jesus, what would change? What are you scared of today? What makes you quake in your sandals? And take a minute and think about that for a minute. Are you scared of being alone? Scared that your colleague, what your colleagues would think? Scared of how your, your friends would treat you? Scared of the medical diagnosis? Fearful of the future? Now listen just for a minute. Because of Jesus' victory on the cross, all of those things are dealt with. You are not alone, and you will never be alone if you're a follower of Jesus. You already have acceptance. You already have a future. You already have hope. You already have everything that the enemy would come and lie to you about and tell you that you need to be frightened of. And so instead of, of responding out of fear, you can, because of the resurrection, respond to those same situations out of victory. Israel stood on that hill in many ways hiding in fear of the Philistine army. But in a moment, in a moment, it dramatically changed as they saw the head of Goliath come off. The army had not changed. Their weapons did not change. Their numbers did not change. However, their actions dramatically changed when Goliath was killed. And when we see Jesus come out of the grave, a loud cry from our camp should arise. And we too should change how we respond. What, do you, what are you really frightened of? And how do you need to respond today? Jesus says, look, I dealt with your Goliath. So don't live like he's still a threat. What needs to change for you today and how you live? What needs to change for me and how I live? You see, the empty tomb should have such a dramatic impact on us. So much so that, that it should change us. We should be able to love with abandon. Why? Because our Goliath has been defeated, so that person's not a threat to us anymore. We're free to love everyone. Let, let's talk about forgiveness. I mean, the enemy might say to you, listen, you can't forgive them. And there's this great fear that might come over because, you know, 
Because then it's like they're getting away with it. To which we respond, I think, out of victory instead of fear. And we say, listen, if I don't forgive, it will put me in a box and hold me captive. I'm not going to serve that. I've been freed. I, I've been delivered. I will not be held captive by fear by that anymore. I'm living out of victory. So too bad, devil, I'm forgiving them. Maybe you say, I, I'm not going to worry so much about what people think. I'm going to be Jesus in this world. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, the author calls the followers of Jesus to, to live in a certain way, like loving people and remembering those in prison. And then in verse 6, he says this. It says this, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear, for what can man do to me? And he's quoting David himself from the Psalms. For what can man do to me? What would be different if you lived out of that victory? And who would be affected by that? There could be someone in, in, your, in your workplace or your school who needs to see Jesus, but we're too scared of what people might think. But when we look at the resurrected Jesus, we can say, look, I, I don't need to be scared of what others think. He loves me. The God of the universe loves me and has accepted me and is fighting for me. Look, I, I know there are going to be days that, that are hard. There are going to be days that, that are scary. Absolutely. Things that suddenly happen, and, and, and they just breathe fear into us. But when that happens, we stop, we take a deep breath, and then we take our eyes off of what's bringing us fear and put them on our deliverer putting them on Jesus who defeated death itself. If the Israelites decided to look back on their weapons or their lack of people or whatever and forgot about David holding the head of Goliath, well, they may have gone back to being scared too. And I don't know what sort of fear is holding you from moving forward in what God has for you, but I know this, that when it holds you, you serve it. What would it look like if you were free from that? And what if there was a whole church of people who lived like that? Who ran into the fray because we already saw that we were victorious because of Jesus? What would it look like if, if we took some bold faith steps, not to be a deliverer, not to be David, but because we have been delivered? What would it look like if we had a, had a whole church of people who saw differently, who thought differently? I think maybe the enemy would start to lose some ground, is what I think, just like the Philistines did. But the way we'll do that is to keep our eyes off of ourselves and on the one who delivered us. We keep focused on the one who fought our Goliath and defeated him. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15 said, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's you and I, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What will it look like for you today to live in light of victory instead of fear? Who do you need to love, forgive, forgive, or ask forgiveness of, to serve, to share Jesus with, to pray, or to be Jesus too? What kind of ground do you need to take back? Where do you, like the Israeli, the Israeli army in that moment, need to charge forward? Not to deliver, but because you've been delivered. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And we're going to sing, and then we'll close with a word of prayer.
Uh, please stand and um, join us in this next song here. is 
As we look at that story, we see two people. You see David, you see Goliath. You see Goliath as their representative of the Philistine army. You see David as the representative of, of the, the army of Israel. And the thing is, you would partake of the victory or defeat of your representative. And I, I would ask you, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, have you ever partaken of the victory of Jesus on the cross? Have you ever allowed Jesus to be your deliverer for you today, in this moment? Have you done that? And if you've never done that, I would invite you to do that. He desires to be your deliverer in this moment. He really does. And if you're joining us online, the same is for you. We invite you to invite Jesus to be your deliverer. And if you're doing that, even for this first moment, I think you just start and you say, Jesus, I need you. Would you be my deliverer in this moment? I cannot fight this battle. I cannot do this, Lord. But you can. Lord, be my deliverer. And then here's what I want you to do, is just to go, go to the info table after, let us know. If you're online, let us know. But also go to our website, and, and I, I really would encourage you, click on that little Why Jesus thing that's in there. Because that'll be a great help to begin to understand the journey that you're taking and what it means to let Jesus be your deliverer. So let me pray for you today. God, as we come today, Lord Jesus, God, we thank you that you delivered us. Oh, Lord, by all admission, I was in that army frightened. I remember that grade eight moment. Scared, frightened. And yet you, Lord. And yet you, Lord. When I needed a deliverer, you were my deliverer. And because of what you did on the cross, because of your death and resurrection, you have defeated my Goliath. You have defeated our Goliath. And Lord, I do not want to live or walk in fear today or tomorrow. Lord, I want to, I want to walk and run in all that you have for me. And so, Lord, I would pray for us here today, because I know for most of us here, that's our desire. And so, Lord, I, I would pray for us that if there's any sort of a fear or things that, that we're, we're allowing to direct our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray we would just get a glimpse of your victory that would set us free from serving that fear. Just as the Israelite army looked on and they saw the head of Goliath and it changed for them. God, I just pray that you'd give us a glimpse of what you have done, that it would change for us too. And that we would live out of what you have done. So Lord, we love you. We thank you. God, change our perspective. And God, as, as just individuals, I pray you do that, but not just as individuals, as us, as a church. You've placed us here in the corner of 29th and Lynn Valley, Lord. You got a mission, you got a call for us, Lord Jesus. And we don't want to be hindered by fear as a church. No, we want to step into all that you have. 
that God, your name would be lifted high, that what you have done would be exalted, that we would declare you are our victory, not just with our words, but how we live. So Lord, we thank you, we love you. Help us to see your victory this week and how we live in Jesus' name, amen.